Hello, listeners. Been wondering how you can help the show? Probably not. But here are five things you can do. One, subscribe. Support the show by clicking the subscription link in the show notes. Two, review on iTunes, on our website, www.afraidofnothingpodcast.com, or on whatever app you listen to. Three, donate. When you go to our website, click the cute coffee cup icon. Or in the show notes, click the subscription link. Four, share. Sharing really is caring. Tell your friends and even your enemies to check out the show. Five, watch. Wait a minute. It's a podcast, not a movie. Actually, it's both. Check the show notes to find out where to watch the documentary. You can also rent it on Prime Video. That's it. Oh, one last thing. Enjoy this episode. I got to tell you, uh, after COVID, people are really looking for meaningful experiences, and they're willing to spend on it. They spend a lot of money on travel, on Taylor Swifty concerts, and all that stuff. Well, I have a better solution for you who are on a budget. It's called astral traveling. Rather than pony up all the money, just simply lay down, relax, meditate, and bam, you are anywhere in the world, in the universe, even with gray aliens. And that is just part of what tonight's show is all about. In a world where nothing is known, nothing is certain, reality is not real. Wake up! Be afraid of nothing. I'm Bob Heskey. Robert. The host with the ghost. This is my podcast, based on my paranormal documentary, Afraid of Nothing. Each episode, we talk to people who see life and the afterlife through a different lens. Join me. Who is this large man? And what's he doing in our bedroom? As we lift the veil and open our minds to see beyond our eyes lie. This is Afraid of Nothing. Nothing. Tonight's guest, Preston Dennett, began investigating UFOs and the paranormal in 1986 when he discovered that his family, friends, and co-workers were having dramatic, unexplained encounters. Preston has written more than 30 books and more than 100 articles about UFOs and the paranormal, including his latest one, Humanoids and High Strangeness. He is an investigator of the mutual UFO network, MUFON, and an astral traveler. We are bringing back one of my favorite earlier guests. His name is Preston Dennett, and he knows everything UFOs, but we're going to cover that and a lot more tonight. Preston, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Robert. I appreciate it. Also with us is my good buddy and my sometimes co-host, Kyle Carvin, who I'm going to hopefully see at a Paracon in a couple of weeks. Hey, Kyle, how's it going? Hey, Bob. Hey, Preston. Excited to talk with you guys. Awesome. Last time you were on, Preston, was January 2022, and we'll get into the UFO stuff, but one of the things that's always fascinated me, and I I think Kyle, too, because you're kind of a world traveler, uh, is out-of-body experiences. So do you mind talking about how you came upon the ability to do that? And last time we talked, you had mentioned it wasn't scary, but the third time you did it, it was terrifying when you woke up and was looking down at your body. So want to give us a little preview of kind of how you got into that? Yeah, this was something I did actually kind of seek out following the death of my mother in 1984, which was obviously tragic. I was quite young, 19 years old, and was having a lot of dreams about her where I felt she was visiting me. But that couldn't be true because there's no such thing as life after death or ghosts or certainly out-of-body experiences, I thought. But on some level, I knew that it was her. So I was in a bit of a quandary and started looking into dreams, which led to lucid dreaming and then out-of-body experiences. 
If you know anything about astral projection, you've probably heard of Robert Monroe. He's written a series of books on his own experiences. And I picked those up and I found them quite compelling. And in fact, at the end of his, his book, the first one, I think it's called Journeys Out of the Body, he gave exercises on how to do it. So I thought, okay, this sounds a little scary. I'm not sure I even believe in it, but it sounds like it's worth a try. He says anyone can do it. So I really buckled down and did the exercises, which in a nutshell are basically meditation and visualization type exercises. And it worked. I mean, it really worked. Immediately, I started having much more dream recall. And after about a month and a half, two months, I had my first out-of-body experience. And it was unequivocal. I mean, it was real. I knew instantly there was life after death that can go out of body. Because he describes, you know, you'll feel a, a slight vibration, kind of like a mild electric shock. Well, I had laid down one afternoon and I thought that I had accidentally stuck my finger in the light socket next to my bed. <laughs> More than a mild shock then, right? No, I was sure I was being electrocuted. I really thought so. But the next thing I knew, I was, there was a popping noise and I flew out of my body uncontrollably across my room, across the hallway, and into the restroom, the bathroom. And I grabbed the counter and looked up at the mirror, and I was not there. There was nothing there that I could see. So that's when I knew this was real. I was so shocked. I was instantly pulled back. But the very next weekend, I had an identical experience. Third time, like you mentioned, I just woke up one evening, and I was standing next to my bed in the middle of the night. It was very dark. I couldn't see clearly, but finally kind of gathered my head because I felt a little bit dizzy. I had some vertigo, but finally gathered myself together and looked down in bed and, yep, there I was under the covers. And I got the coldest chill. I mean, I thought I had died. It was unbelievably terrifying dread of death. And I dived back into my body, horrified. It was a weird feeling feeling yourself kind of fill up your body like, I don't know, water pouring into a mold, kind of. And I woke up, almost forgot what had happened, but I remembered, and my emotions did a 180-degree turnaround. I was thrilled. And from that point on, I mean, I was hooked. I started really meditating, and it took me a good year to figure out how to stay out longer than a few seconds and how to move and see and do all the things you need to do to have a real, honest-to-God, controlled OBE. But I did it, and I've never looked back. So, so Preston, I have a, a few questions about all that. I've just started reading more about lucid dreaming. Um, I want to get that out there first, but before I ask about that, so what was the gentleman's name that you, you mentioned with the series of books? Uh, Randall? Randall Moore? Robert Monroe. Robert Monroe. I couldn't, I'm so far off. <laughs> Robert Monroe. <laughs> uh, is it somewhat of a guidebook that he has, or is he just talking about his own experiences in it? Um, and if it's any kind of like how to or, or some sort of process to go through, are there dangers in doing so? Are there limitations to be aware of? Like, how much of a choice is it when you're, when you're working on trying to have these experiences? Uh, just, just any kind of dangers, and if there's a choice of, what if you don't want to go back to your body or something like that? And is it your soul? Like, what's the theory of what's actually happening? Yeah. Well, I mean, I'll start with the theory: is that we each have a dream body, an astral body, uh, a desire body, an occult body. It goes by different names, but if you really dig in, it's more than that. There's the etheric body, the astral body the mental body, the causal body. I mean, it goes up. We have multiple bodies, apparently, according to Eastern religions, I should say. And uh, no, as far as I can tell, there is no real danger. And believe me, I have scoured the literature on this uh, because there are some people who say, oh, you know, there's dangers of possession or getting locked out of your body or going too far out. And as far as not wanting to come back, well, yeah, you might have that feeling, but you will be pulled back. 
the trick is really staying out, not getting back. You have what astral travelers would call it a silver cord. This is an energetic sort of cord that keeps you attached to your physical body. It can stretch any distance, but it will keep you secured to your body and pull you back at the least emotion or if you even think of your body, that can pull you right back. Uh, but no, I haven't found any evidence, solid evidence of dangers really at all. I found the opposite. I found about 20 cases of people who are physically healed. And you can learn about your past lives. You can visit your deceased loved ones. That alone is worth the price of admission. Yeah. Because you know for sure there is life after death and you get to visit people that you've lost. I mean, there's nothing greater. You see, that, that, and that's really interesting because that kind of lends to like the, this silver cord that you mentioned. It's almost like this, this tether that is in place by design from, I'm not sure if it would be a, a god or some sort of uh, spiritual leader of some sort, or, uh, but it almost implies that something out there is encouraging us to do this, to practice this. And they're putting this safety measures in place for us to go out and, and just experiencing this probably for, you know, the bigger, uh, you know, there's probably a grand design to everything is what it sounds like to me. So it's very interesting yeah, well, that just, there's, there's these measures. If I could just jump in real quick. Jump yeah. Astral projection is in a way a misnomer because the fact is we're going to go back to the other side at some point, all of us. And what we're really doing is projecting down here from our true home. This is a, the 3D life we have here is really the projection. We're projecting down here from the place where we truly come from, where we came from and where we're going. So in a way, it's kind of the reverse of how a lot of people are looking at it. Uh, I just think that's an important point. But yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. The astral body can doesn't age. And you can fly, you can, all of these abilities that we consider supernatural, like telepathy and telekinesis and healing and all of these things is the natural habitat of the astral body. So when you're on the other side, yeah, you can fly, you can do telepathy. That's how people communicate on the other side. You know, I, I uh, going back to like the lucid dreaming, is something I actually heard about that was there's this question that (laughs) I guess somebody had discovered. I don't know. I've heard about it a few times now. There's this question where if you become, you know, the whole idea and correct me if I'm wrong of lucid dreaming is you're, you're aware that you're dreaming um, and you can almost control your actions. You can control your experience while doing so. Is that about right? Yeah, that's precisely it. In a way, it's very, it's, the brother or the the sibling of an out-of-body experience. Sure. Somebody had mentioned that while they were dreaming, they asked somebody in their dream, they asked another person, what was the date and time? And they said they had such evil looks from everyone. Uh, I don't remember the exact responses, but they were they actually sounded really creepy. Things like the responses they would get was like, you're not allowed to ask that here. You you can't ask that. How do you know? Such odd responses. But is, is that something that you've heard of or, or at all? <laughs> um, no, actually, I have not tried that. I don't think I've ever read about that either. Uh, that's certainly interesting. I have been on the other side and asked people if they're dead. <laughs> and that, gave, yeah. that got me some dirty looks. <laughs> well, I'm not. You know, I'm alive. And yeah. Boy, every head in the room turned and looked at me. This was one of the lower realms I would describe it as, perhaps not the higher. I'm not a really religious guy, but the heavenly realms is a good description because, I mean, that's what it feels like. But there are lower realms, certainly, where people might go who are not earthbound, but not going as high, perhaps, as they could. There's different levels. A couple of questions. You mentioned the other heavenly realms, and they're all kind of based on vibrations. If you vibrate lower, you're in some of the darker ones. And if you vibrate higher, you're in some of the safer, better ones. So do you just naturally vibrate higher, Preston, and so that you kind of avoid some of the riffraff in the lower realms? 
Um, you know, I wish I could give you a super clear answer on that. I would say you go to where you resonate with and you can travel to as high as you possibly can. But at some point, you know, I've been to places I can't or I've tried to get to places which are just too high of energy for me. But at the same time, if you go to the lower realms, yeah, it's very dense and the energy there is not nice. So I would say most people who pass away are going to be just fine. They're immediately going to go off to where most people go when they die, which is like the, it's a garden sort of area. Yeah, I call it the heavenly realms. I don't know what, really what else to call it, but it's very pastoral. And the lower realms are a little bit less pastoral and more urban structures, but there's certainly earthbound spirits. And I've gotten out of my body and wandered around the house, perhaps, or in the streets and seen people who are absolutely earthbound and not having a good time with it. Um, I'm curious about is like the techniques that you practice for, for those out there who, who, like myself, would want to. I, th- I listened to your the last time you were on with Bob and you had spoken about uh, meditations and and uh, I forget everything that you said, but this process of practicing, basically, it, how intense is that? Uh, I think you said you were able to pick it up after a couple months or a few months of really working at it. So I'm curious of how intense was the prep work and if you think everybody's available to do this. Yeah, well, I mean, yes, this is a natural human ability. We are all actually doing this every night. So the real trick is remembering it. Mm -hmm. And really the only obstacles, as far as I can tell, are basically skepticism. People don't think they can do it, so they don't even try. Fear, It's they're like, wow, that sounds scary, which I understand it can be, especially at first. And just plain laziness. They're not willing to do the exercises, meditations. And the more effort you put forth, the more successful you will be, for sure. Uh, And some people might have a steep learning curve. Some people just kind of naturally catch up to it. I mean, it's easy for them. Uh, And I've taught workshops on how to do this. I've taught family members how to do it. It's not hard. And in a nutshell, there's three or four main steps. The first is just physically relaxing. And this is where a lot of people trip up, I think, because, you know, people go to sleep and they're grinding their teeth and clenching their fists and tossing and turning all night. They're not truly relaxed. You want to relax to the point where you almost don't feel your body, where you start to feel certain sensations like heaviness or lightness or movement, numbness, perhaps uh, ideally what they call the vibratory state, which I described earlier, you'll feel sort of vibration running through your body, which can be quite pronounced, to say the least, or even mild in some cases. As you get practiced, you'll bypass that. Okay. Yeah, you want to get relaxed, relaxed, relaxed to the point you're just about to fall asleep. Yeah. And the second step would be relaxing your mind, because we have a stream of consciousness that's filled with all the, our thoughts going through the day. And then when we go to sleep at night, it's still going, of course, and that's our dreams. We fall into it unconscious. So what you want to do is just step back from that to the extent that you can. And you want to get to the point where you start to see your thoughts, hear your thoughts. You'll see colors, you'll see faces, you'll hear people's voices. And you just want to step back and, you know, ultimately it would be nice if you could stop it. (laughs) But that's not going to be easy for a beginner, I don't think. Uh, I mean, when I started, I would hear a big brass band playing. I'd hear every song I heard all day. (laughs) I mean, we are literally, our minds are racing on multiple levels. Mm -hmm. So we want to overcome that to the extent that we can. So don't procrastinate. (laughs) Overcome your, you know, the seven deadly sins, supposedly, because those steal your attention, your focus, your intent. So it's partly mental as well. Mm -hmm. So you relax physically, you relax mentally, and then you just do visualizations and affirmations. Mm. That's pretty simple. Any visualization that entails movement is really effective. So by that, I mean visualize yourself running down a pathway. That's how I started out, and it worked really well for me. Or rolling out of bed, 
or standing on the bow of a boat that's going up and down in the waves, or a swing set, or an escalator, or jumping off a cliff. That's a little scary, yeah. <laughs> but it works. Uh, anything that involves movement, or for that matter, you can visualize a location or person that you know well. And if you have a deceased loved one, focus on them. I call this the love bridge because they are waiting there for you. They want you to meet them. Mm. They'll be right by your bedside and suddenly you'll see their face and it becomes very real. And then it is real and you're pulled out of your body. So that is a very effective method. And I've got one final trick and this is the best one of all. And I hope people at least try this. And this is something you can do throughout the day. You do what's called reality testing or critical reflection. Because here's the problem. We're unconscious a third of our lives, basically. We're out there on the other side, not even aware that we are out of body. Or to an extent we are, but we're not able to connect the third dimension consciousness with the astral consciousness. So what you want to do is throughout the day, ask yourself, am I dreaming right now? Could I possibly be out of body at this very moment? And this sounds silly because ultimately, I mean, you immediately know you're not. I mean, you know, right? <laughs> but you think you know, you don't. Here's mm -hmm. the thing. So what you want to do is try jumping up and flying. If that's a little ridiculous, throw an object in the air, a pen, a ball piece of paper, something to see if it floats. Another way to test reality is to try to stick your finger through your desk, your chair, a wall next to you, any solid object. And of course, it's not going to go through. And if you throw up a pencil, it's going to fall right back down. And also look around you for any anomalies. Does everything look the way it's supposed to look? So if you do this three, four, five, Ultimately, I mean, ideally, 10 times a day, you're going to do this at night. And it works so well because what will happen is you'll be at work, perhaps. You're like, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this reality testing. I'm going to throw my pen up in the air. And you're going to get this huge shock when your pen floats or when your finger goes right through your desk or when you see something that's just not right. Because if you look at your dreams, and I wrote down every dream I ever had, I interviewed everyone I knew on their dreams, there is always an anomaly. It's a cue designed to wake you up to question reality. So that is the method that really works best, uh, reality testing. Awesome. I love, all, I love all of those. Thank you so much. And, and then um, if you're willing to, to give the shot of asking someone what time, what's the time and, and date. And, and even if it's off the record, <laughs> if you want to let us know, like if any, what kind of reaction you get, if, what, if, if that's a thing or not, I'd love to, I'd love to hear. I certainly want to try that myself at some point. Yeah. I'm absolutely going to put that on my bucket list. Or yeah. <laughs> I'm curious now. And good luck to you because I hear every, everybody that's ever, that I have read about that said it has been really frightened by the experience. So. Yeah, well, I've never really been frightened out of body because it's safe. It's as safe as sleeping. Sure. Honestly, it really is. See, that's interesting because I do think like the the people that I have read it, which is only three or four instances, and they were and it was by accident. They're like they it's not something that they try to do. It's not something that they practice. They just tried it while they were in the serious dream. So, yeah, I'd love to hear what happens. That's a good question because time is different. <laughs> right. Body, I mean, it's it's hard to explain, but it's almost like you're pulled out of the time stream. Yeah. You experience quite a bit in just a few moments. Wow. That's so cool. You know, we're going to talk about UFOs in a little bit. Do you ever run into any aliens or, or, or from your experience, are aliens and extraterrestrials, do they have the same capabilities? Yeah, as far as I know, they do. I've certainly had contactees tell me that. Me personally, it only happened once, and it really shocked me, and I really would like to experience it again because I didn't react how I wish I would have. Because what I, I do when I pop out of body is you can explore the physical world if you want, but it gets old. The real fun is on the higher dimensions. 
So basically what I do is, and how I get there is just flying real fast. And I hit this sort of barrier, or I guess you'd call it the veil between the dimensions. And it's sort of cloudy-like and dark and misty. And so I was racing through that one day and trying to get to the higher realms. And I saw someone standing, sort of vertical, I should say, in front of me. I'm like, well, that looks like, is that a person's eyes? You know, I couldn't really tell. It was distant and misty. But as I got closer and closer, I realized I was going to pass right by this person. And as I zoomed up to them, because I was booking, I was going fast. I saw it was a gray, a little gray ET. And not threatening at all, but definitely the big head, the gray skin, the large dark eyes. And darned if I didn't come right up to this guy when he was a couple of feet away. And it just really surprised me to the point where I turned and looked at him. He looked at me and watched me as I raced by. And given a second chance, I would have immediately stopped and been like, hey, dude, you know, what's up? But I didn't. I, for whatever reason, yeah, I was just shocked. It's really my one and only that I can point to that's definite. Boy, when you when you say that, I, I think of the Twilight Zone opening with the door and the eye and all those things floating through space, you know. <laughs> I never thought of it like that. There was one incident, one, there may be more since then, uh, where you actually got caught astro traveling and the person you visited saw you. <laughs> and not only that, there was a ghost that saw you. So can you tell us that story? Yeah, this is so interesting to me because when I started doing this, my family thought I had lost their, my mind. <laughs> They're like, you know, what are you talking about? And I would go and visit them and they could not see me. I would appear in front of friends and strangers, and it's an eerie feeling when you're trying to get someone's attention, and they just walk right through you. And I'm like, well, this is frustrating. <laughs> I mean, it makes you question your own sanity. I did prove it to myself that this is real by going to locations astrally and then visiting it physically and determining like, oh, yeah, this is what I saw. But no, no one would ever see me. And then, of course, I met Dolly Safran who's the subject of my book, Symmetry. She's a contactee, but also a medium and has a lot of psychic abilities. And I just thought on a whim, you know what? I'm going to try and visit her because <laughs> this is you know, what you do. And so I did. She, I was in California. She was in Florida. And you can traverse very vast distances instantly. Kind of like, what do they call it? Teleporting. Um, sometimes you're out of body and you're just meandering along but sometimes you're like, give your destination and boom, you're there. And that's what happened. And I popped out in this room and I thought, okay, well, I don't see her, but there's a gentleman sitting on a lawn chair. And I walked up to him. And I'm like, hey, what's your name? And gosh, if I remember correctly, I did write it down. I think he said, I'm, I'm Norman. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> Is Dolly here? And he pointed to the doorway. He was a kind of a gruff old man just sitting there. <laughs> I'm like, okay. And at that point, the door did open and I saw Dolly. Uh, and she was on the phone. She wasn't facing me at first, but then she kind of turned sideways and she saw me and her head whirled and her hair whirled around with it. And she looked straight at me right in the eye. And I'm like, Dolly. And she looked at me and she said, I can't talk now. I'm being robbed. <laughs> and I thought, oh my God, you know, that's horrible. And the emotion, of course, pulled me right back. And at this point, we were talking daily because I was interviewing her about her UFO experiences. And she called me up and we started talking. I didn't say anything because I figure the first thing she's going to say is, you know, I, I, I was robbed last night <laughs> and she wasn't. And I thought, well, gosh, you know, maybe I made all of this up because. I mean, that's the first thing I would say. And then finally she says, oh, I saw you. You came and astral projected to me. <laughs> I'm like, wow, you did. You did see me because I saw you see me. What did you say to me? Because you said something. And she said, I can't talk now. I'm on the phone with Rob. So I <laughs> misunderstood her. <laughs> but it was close enough that I, th I felt like that was confirmation. Yeah. And 
turnabout's fair play. <laughs> and it was about a week later, I'm in bed sleeping. And suddenly the room fills up with light, wakes me up, this golden light. I'm like, oh, what's going on? And there's Dolly standing next to my bed, this enormous golden aura around her. <laughs> and she is grinning from ear to ear. So that was how we started actually astral projecting together. I mean, she took me on some adventures that oh, wow. she's good at. It. I mean, she is absolutely in full control. Yeah, before we jump to that book and her story, but that gentleman, Norman, what did you find out about him that was surprising, that was in the garage? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I asked Dolly about that. And she's like, oh, yeah, I know exactly who that is. <laughs> he follows me. You know, he passed away. Uh, he's, I guess, enamored with her. Um, she's like, oh, yeah, I know exactly who that is. Um, she described him, and I described him, and it matched. So, yeah, it's not at all unusual, at least for me at this point, to see earthbound souls or people who are just hanging around. I mean, not too long ago, this freaked me out. I, I walked out, and there was someone in my house. And uh, I live near a graveyard, so there's a lot of people wandering around. And I, I would ask them their names. You know, and are they dead? And they're like, oh, yeah, my name. One guy said, my name is Thoreau Dean. I'm like, okay. Mm -hmm. I, I looked him up. I couldn't find him. But just recently, there was this little boy, seven years old, cute as a button. And I looked down, down at him and I asked him, you know, are you dead? He's like, yeah, I was mauled. He says, my name is Buster. And I was mauled by a bull. Yikes. <laughs> like, oh, my God. <laughs> I mean, that shocked me. It pulled me right back into my body. That's um, one. It's awesome that you live next to a cemetery. That's always, I want to live in a cemetery. That's like a goal in my life. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. And a little off topic, but not much. But the whole, a lot of the theories about, you know, what a spirit or a ghost is, there's so many. But something that I heard recently, uh, I'm not sure if it was with Bob, if it was with another guest or not, that not all ghosts were actually, or not all spirits or encounters um, were necessarily people that have passed, but rather just some sort of traumatic event happened. Like say a new resident moves into a home and they experience some sort of like residual haunting, so to speak, that it actually could just be so the, the prior uh, resident of the house who had some high impact energy event that left that energetic imprint there. So maybe when people are coming in and they're feeling this this energy, that it doesn't necessarily have to mean like those people, the, the people that they're feeling the energy of could just be on the other side of town. Uh, and I, I had never heard or considered that before, but it makes sense to me when we're talking about how everything is very much energy based and frequencies and vibrations. So that, that seems plausible. And also in what you just said was, and I hope I didn't lose it now. Oh gosh, what was it? Um, well, I think I did forget it. But um, anyway, I guess that's enough. I'll 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 probably think of it. No worries, we'll edit that out. It's okay. Um, no, you keep it in. <laughs> I like it. I still I think, still keep it in. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and we have that recorded too that you wanted. That's to right. Yeah, keep it in, Bob. <laughs> so, uh, Preston. So you eventually you and. Dolly became your kind of, your out of body experience buddies. She, every once in a while, we meet someone in our life that's fascinating. We're like, God, I have to write a book about this person, and you did about Dolly. So we want to talk about your new book in a little bit. But can you give us the the the, the main the main story beats of of what what you wrote about and your experiences with her? Yeah, absolutely. I was super excited when Dolly contacted me over the internet to because she was looking for someone to help tell her story she has had a lifelong experiences with ets fully conscious by the way not recalled through hypno hypnotic regression not through the lens of fear at age 14 she had a really major missing time encounter which she ended up fully remembering the next morning and from that point on she had fully conscious encounters on a weekly basis her case is easily the most extensive I have not only investigated, but ever read about. So we're talking her being on board and learning how to pilot the craft. 
And I know how that might sound to skeptics, but I'd already talked to a number of people who'd had that experience. So hearing her say it was thrilling because she had a lot of details others didn't. Uh, she's worked very closely with greys, mostly, but all different types of ETs, and just had I mean, <laughs> a lifetime of experiences. And by that, I mean going to other planets, being on board the craft when other people are being picked up, usually to be healed or checked out physically or given messages of some kind. And gosh, what else can I say? She does have a lot of evidence to support her story, photographic evidence, film evidence, medical evidence, implant evidence, corroborating witnesses. Uh, she's gone on large mother ships, I guess we would call them, where she's seen arboretums and animal husbandry centers, which are filled not only with earth animals, but animals and plants from other planets. Uh, she's worked very, very closely with the ETs on multiple fronts. So, yeah, it's quite an amazing story. And is there one or two nuggets in there? Like your 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 new book, um, Humanoids and High Strangeness, has like 20 never-before-published accounts that you've gathered, and they're all kind of unique, and they're all – it's interesting. It's like a – it's like a buffet of uh, of paranormal or of UFO encounters. Is there one or two things? I'm, I'm wondering, like a UFO encounter that was very interesting, or a where you both astro traveled together, where you went someplace that was uh, kind of mind blowing. Oh yeah, well both. I mean, one experience, I th her experience at age 14, I think was an absolute gem of an experience. <laughs> because she was taken on board and they gave her a tour of the craft, everything from the engine room to the observation deck to her quarters to what they call the place of movement, which is basically the helm, the control room. They sat her down in the seat and they said, hold on, we're going to take a ride and you are going to pilot the, the ship. This was the first time she did it with assistance, of course, but they took her to see the planet Saturn. And that thrilled me because that's exactly what Jay Gardner, another contactee, told me that happened to him. He was around age 10 or 11 when it happened. Dolly was 14. I know of other cases. This is what uh, Raymond Fowler described. He's a well-known researcher. He had this experience. But then they took her not only to Saturn, but through the rings on top, did whole orbits around it, and then to the moon did orbits around the moon, showed her what we would call alien bases. They're not active, but they're certainly not man-made uh, structures on the dark side of the moon, actually landed on the moon. And again, I know how this might sound to skeptics, but I talked to a Navy medic. He had that experience. He's a great witness, Kevin Kamen. Uh, they took him to the moon, some praying mantis-type ETs. But yeah, she's had a lot of experiences that are absolutely mind-blowing. One of our most thrilling OBEs, if I may, that we shared together, well, she took me, showed up in my room, and I was out of body, and she's like, let's go. I want to show you something. I'm like, okay, I'm game. Let's do this. And took me by the hand, and off we flew to the Kuiper belt, the asteroid belt. And I never saw anything so beautiful in my life. Because this stretches out immensely for, I don't know how big it is, but it looked like a thousand miles in every direction of asteroids glinting in the sun. I mean, you could see them. And they were different shades of black, white, and gray. Uh, and I'm just strikingly clear. Because when you're out of body, you can your vision is different. You have absolute perfect vision. You can zoom in. You can do panoramic view. So it, your vision is excellent. And then she pointed to, to one thing and said, look at that. What do you think that is? And I looked, and this was not natural. <laughs> this was a perfectly round, sort of orangish glowing sphere. How huge. And that's really all I remember. But I woke up the next morning, and we talked about it. And she's like, did you see it? Did you see the thing? And I'm like, uh, what do you mean? She says, did you see, what, what did you see? And I described what I just told you. And she says, well, what do you think that was? And I said, I really have no idea, but I can tell you it wasn't natural. 
And she said, aha, that's right. That's ET. That's a ET construction. She's been inside what we would call Dyson spheres, uh, which is a sort of science fiction concept, but is apparently a reality with ETs, which are large artificial planetoids. And she's been inside of some of these. She actually thought she was on a planet, but they're like, oh, no, no, no. This is what you call a Dyson sphere because there was lakes and rivers and fields and mountains. Uh, and absolutely, it was an artificial planetoid. But it's it's almost like, uh, oh, I forget that movie with Jim Carrey where he's inside something, you know. But uh, it's almost like it's you're inside a terranium or whatever, but it's inside the planet versus on the surface. Is yeah, that what you're yeah, saying? The Truman Show. I love that movie. <laughs> yeah, Truman Show, right? Yeah, yeah that's it. Uh, what's the process for <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll say this uh, being one of the lucky recipients of, of, of being visited or being a subject of interest by ETs and yeah yeah well I've really dug into this too because I've interviewed a lot of people and I always wondered like why this person and why not that person yeah it's evenly divided between men and women people of all ancestries you know, I've interviewed people who are black or Asian or Latino or Pacific Islander or Caucasian. So it's not that. It's not blood type. It's not based on religion or politics or anything. I mean, I really started to wonder what's going on here. Is this random? Mm -hmm. But it's not. Uh, certainly, at least 50% of the people I've interviewed, and I think it's probably a little higher than that, could be closer to 100% even. It's... Um, how would I put this? Generational. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're having major contact, the chances are really good your parents have, or at least aunts or uncles or grandparents, and certainly children. Uh, I mean, I just recently interviewed someone for my latest book on humanoids. Four generations of people are having contact. So that's a pattern. Another is that people who are psychic are much more likely to have contact. People who report any kind of a psychic ability at all, whether it's you know being able to see ghosts or have past life recall or precognitive dreams. And it's a two-way street because contact will ignite those abilities. But there's absolutely a connection there. And I found a few other patterns. Certainly people driving around late at night on the remote highway <laughs> That increases your chances. If you're outside a lot, your profession is perhaps a truck driver, a night watchman, or a police officer, or young children hiking around. Or if you live in a UFO hotspot, like perhaps San Luis Valley, upstate New York, uh, Santa Monica Mountains, Sedona, Arizona, these are areas which are known for high levels of UFO activity. So that seems to increase one's chances. Uh, or if you hang around with someone who is a contactee, that absolutely increases your chances. If you're just driving along with them and boom, they have an experience, well, you will too. But I did find another pattern. Or, or I actually want to talk about two other patterns. One pattern is your profession, what you do for a living. And this really shocked me because... I just wasn't looking for or expecting this. And it all came clear to me when I was interviewing this lady from Norway who had been visited by greys and healed of chronic back pain. She basically, long story short, had greys come in, place an instrument on her back, energy came through, and they healed her chronic back pain, and off they went through the wall and gone. And so I asked her, I'm like, listen, you know, after I did the whole interview, I started asking all the questions I ask. I'm like, do you have a history of contact? Because almost always they'll say, oh, I had contact as a child. I said, no, nope, never before or since. And I dug in because I was pretty sure that there had to be something there, but there wasn't. I'm like, okay, has anyone in your family had contact? And she said, no, no, this was a one-off. And that's why I'm curious about it. And I just started asking all these questions and asked her what she did for a living. And she said, please not use her name because she's quite well known in her area for doing animal and human rights. 
And that struck a chord with me because I just interviewed Michael Carter, a gentleman who is also a contactee, also healed, but fights against racism. And I started, I mean, the bells started going off because I thought, well, John Hunter Gray, he's a social worker. Dolly Saffron, she's a nurse. So these are people who are doing good work for humanity in some capacity. A guy in England who's an inventor, they actually told him, this is why we contacted you. We want you to continue your work with electronics. Uh, so that is absolutely a pattern. It's people who are environmentalists, social workers, doctors, teachers, musicians, for sure. They love musicians. And there's a long list of musicians. What about actors? What, what about actors? They like, I... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can act like all those things. Yeah, uh, yeah. Listening to that too, um, I was going to ask, like, if you had any ideas of an end game, so to speak, or what was the motivation for them to be in contact to to show us and and to guide us in a lot of ways. But it seems like that last bit. It seems like they really want to help do just that, like guide us towards a better existence, so to speak. 100%. Yeah, they're helping those who help others. Yeah. That's exactly what they told this couple I interviewed who were invited on board a UFO in Sedona. Uh, he was healed of carpal tunnel syndrome and a bad uh, knee. From He was a postal worker and basically messed up his knees. And she asked him, well, why don't you just come down and fix things? And they said, we can't do that. We are helping those who help others. But there are karmic laws. You have to solve your own problems. We can only intervene to a certain extent. But I do want to add one more thing, you know, as, as to who has contact and why. And how, you know, are some people luckier than others? Anyone can have contact. And the more I research this, I think most people at some level have had some level of contact or are certainly known by them. But if you want contact, it's all a matter of reaching out to them, meditating, elevating your psychic abilities, because this is what they're looking for. They want people who can hear them, who have the ability to work with them. Uh, this is one of their main goals, is to wake us up to who we are as immortal beings, as people who can do physical levitation and mediumship and psychic reading and precognition and remote viewing and all of these things. Healing. Healing is a big part of it. So many people I've talked to come away from their experiences with the ability to do what I would call hands-on healing or Reiki or something along that those lines. So that is absolutely, I've got case after case of this, a couple in the book of people who never had contact and reached out for it, and boy, did they get it. Your first book, your very first book, uh, 31 books ago, was on healings with UFOs, right? Yeah, because I was shocked to hear that this was not being discussed, and yet it was a prominent part of UFO contact, and I reissued that book. That one covered 100 cases. This latest one, The Healing Power of UFOs, has 300 wow. from all over the <laughs> world, reaching back 100 years from pretty much every major researcher out there. This is absolutely one of the main focuses of why people are being pulled on board. And I'm not speculating here. I can prove this through the actual first-hand cases. There's a lot of people out here speculating and cherry-picking and shoe-fitting and trying to put forth their theories. And that's not solving any mysteries. That's not how science is done. You collect the evidence and you look for commonalities. You try to figure out, you know, what is true or not, you know, why are they doing these things? What is the motivation behind it? But I can tell you for sure that healing is a big part of this because I've got cases from John Mack, Bud Hopkins, David Jacobs, Edith Fiore, Barbara Lamb, Yvonne Smith, Timothy Good. I mean, I could go on and on. All, pretty much all major researchers have multiple cases and it's not getting the attention it deserves. Yeah, I was going to actually ask about that because that's something, you know, I I'm I consider myself like a healthy skeptic, meaning I lie in the the side of belief of all this, especially the more people I I talk with and the more that I read and and research. But I also have to realize that 
it may not be practical at certain times just to be a blind believer of everything. Uh, that said, I feel like there's a very large suppression of info of, of this kind of, in terms of what we generally call like paranormal. Do you have thoughts or theories of why there seems to be this general suppression by the powers that be, or why there's this almost like a synchronized smearing of of people that come forth with their experiences when they seem to be so different, when it feels like this this information is is very real, and and you know as time goes on, it, it, there are more and more people, especially from the scientific community, that lend credibility into this. It seems like there are more people slowly trickling out over the years, and they're releasing this information. But w- what do you think is this general suppression of of this kind of experience? Yeah, well, there certainly is a suppression. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> there is a cover up. It's demonstrable. It's infuriating. Yeah. This is our tax dollars. This is an enormous amount of time, un- money, and energy being spent to cover up the subject, make witnesses look like idiots. This has been the go to for the, I guess you'd call it the secret government for decades. Mm-hmm. Who thinks they saw a UFO is either hoaxing hallucinating or misperceiving. This has been a deliberate smearing campaign, a debunking campaign, a cover-up. And it's hard to say exactly why, because I am not privy. Sure. You know, I'm not in the, in the need to know category, <laughs> but I've a lot of research into this, sir. Yeah. But you do a lot of exposure. I mean, you're, you've got uh, going your fourth <laughs> decade of, uh, you know, since 1986 of doing this. You're a MUFON investigator. You're, you're a ghost investigator. You're a prolific author, um, also a, non, uh, a, a fiction writer as well, uh, besides your nonfiction books. Have you ever dealt with any pushback or any men in, you know, what do they call them? The, the, the black men or what? Oh, oh God, my memory's really bad. What do they call the, uh, the men that show up on your doors? Your oh, the doors? men in black? The men in black. How about that? Yeah. yeah the men, you ever have any of that happen to you, Preston? Yeah, I sure yeah. have. Wow. A, <laughs> okay. Yeah, to a limited extent. It's funny because some researchers have looked into this and found proof that UFO researchers, and for that matter, contactees, are being surveilled. Uh, there's no doubt about this. People have, you know, gone through the Freedom of Information Act to get their files out of the FBI or the NSA or what have you. Uh, so we know that this is true. And I have evidence of it personally. I think the first time it happened was when I was investigating the Topanga Canyon UFO wave. This was in 1992 to 1994 in Southern California. And I was going all out to investigate this wave of sightings that involved not only sightings, but landings and cars being chased down the road and people being taken on board and the whole deal. I mean, I contacted the police, gave them my number. I was getting cases that way. I put up flyers. I was cold calling people through the phone book. I was knocking on doors. I was camping out. I was going to find out what was going on. And I ended up interviewing a good 50, 100 people for that wave of sightings only. And it was during that time that I received a call from some gentleman who had me identify himself, myself. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm the guy who's investigating this wave. He says, okay. And he gave me a name and I honestly don't remember what it was, but I do remember what he said. (laughs) I'll never forget it. He said, I, that he was a Colonel who did, Satellite mapping in the Vietnam War has a top secret clearance, and he was going on and on about his resume. I'm like, okay, we'll get to the point. Do you have a? This is what I'm thinking, because I want to hear us. You know, what do you have to say? And finally, he said, you know, you shouldn't be investigating UFOs. I said, why not? He said, it's dangerous. You don't know what you're getting into. You could get hurt. I'm like, oh, really? (laughs) Why is it dangerous? He said, well, it's not what you think it is. I said, oh, well. So now what I think it is, what is it? He said, you're barking up the wrong tree. So he started talking in circles. And I started to get a little impatient, frustrated with him because he was being very coy in his answers. And finally, he said, listen, there's no pay dirt in it. And immediately I thought, well, wait a second. How can it be dangerous if there's nothing to it? So at that point, it was clear I wasn't going to get any information out of it. And, and out of him. He was just trying to intimidate me. 
you know, I'm a real young man. I'm gung ho. Uh, I was thrilled actually. I'm like, wow, maybe I touched a nerve. Yeah. But yeah, a couple of things like that. I had real phone problems. Back then we had snail mail. My mail was coming back opened. No doubt. Wow. I mean, I brought people like you open my mailbox and tell me what you see inside. Cause I was sending out manuscripts trying to get these books published, which wasn't easy. Let me tell you, I mean, that book on Topanga, the Topanga Canyon UFO wave, I sent to 50 publishers. Yeah. Wow. They didn't have self publishing in the, when you're your first five or 10 books, I guess, right now it's easier to, which, which you probably have a publisher anyways, but now it's easier to get a book out there on Amazon. Yeah, well, now I get requests from publishers, so <laughs> I've done my work. <laughs> nice. Yeah, that's the way to do it. Yeah, and, and just one more thing along those lines uh, regarding when I met Dolly Safran face-to-face for the first time, we were meeting up at an Airbnb in Laughlin, Nevada. Well, actually, we were in Bullhead City, Arizona, which is right nearby because there was the UFO Megacon. And... uh we were driving back from the conference, it's a week-long conference, to the Airbnb that we rented, which was, I don't know, seven, ten miles away. And it's quite off on some side streets there, off the main highway. So I turned off the main highway and noticed immediately the car turned with me. I thought, okay, coincidence. Made another turn, it followed me again. Made a third turn, it still followed me, at which point I said, Dolly, <laughs> I think we're being followed. And she kind of looked at me because she had already told me all about being surveilled and sent me pictures and a lot of evidence of this. And we made about three or four more turns to the Airbnb and I pulled into the driveway and this guy, of course, follows us. (laughs) And we park in the driveway and walk into the house and I'm at the doorway and this darn guy pulls up and blocks the driveway and glares at us. And I'm like, oh my God look at this dolly she just kind of shrugged and smiled and said told you this is my this is my life i deal with this daily I'm like, man this is crazy yeah well you are certainly undaunted my friend you're on your 31st book and i know we're near the end of it but i want to give you a few minutes to promote i mean i'm sure you've treat kyle and i throughout this first 50 minutes 55 minutes with your experiences I'm sure our audience is just kind of smacking their lips to read what's all the the 20 different, all unique UFO um, encounters in your book, Humanoids and High Strangeness. You want to give us a little soundbite about the book, why you wrote it, and maybe one of your favorite personal nuggets from it? Yeah, sure. I appreciate that. Yeah, 20 true cases. The theme of this one is, of course, humanoids and the fact that there's a lot of high strangeness surrounding ET contact, a lot of which doesn't make the cut in other people's books. I know this for a fact because I've talked to witnesses who said, well, they edited out some of the weirder aspects. And I'm not going to do that. I'm going to tell the whole truth and lay it all out. So this is what the theme of the book is about. And it's not just grays. We're talking a wide variety of humanoids that people see. Little blue men, Mantids, praying mantis, human-looking ETs, tall whites. There's a case involving a short, hairy little kind of demonic dwarf. (laughs) Angels, certainly. Um, Bigfoot, ghostly activity. Uh, One guy, he swears he saw an elf. And, you know, after doing my research and finding other accounts, I believe him. (laughs) Uh, Probably one of my favorite cases comes from a pilot, Hector Sawiak. He allowed me to use his real name. And he's from Argentina. It's another thing I love about this book. It covers not only the U.S., but Canada, South America, Europe, all over the world. Germany, England, France, uh, many different cases. But Hector is a pilot, a commercial pilot. He was the manager of one of the largest, or the largest bank in Argentina, actually. So a great witness, a really intelligent guy with no history of contact, but heard about sightings in his area decided he wanted to see a UFO and went out to see one and nothing showed up. He was really disappointed, but went to bed that night and he was woken up by his name being called Hmm. telepathically, went to the window and saw a UFO zoom by. And it was one week later, he had direct contact. ET showed up in his room. It lit up with light, scared the daylights out of him until they said, 
you have no need to fear. We will not hurt you. He said at that point, he felt an intense, over-encompassing love from them, an overwhelming love. He said it was a love like he's never felt before. And one of them walked up to him, cradled his head in its arms and said, we have come to heal you, and gave him this little brown triangular pill, which he ate. He said it was quite bitter. And that was, in essence, the experience. He wasn't ill, but he did wake up somewhat nauseous. So it's a bit curious as to why exactly they were doing that. Maybe there was a looming illness, hard to say, but a really benevolent encounter, which I like because he reached out to them. He has no history of contact. It's an amazing case. Wow. Yeah, that's great. I mean, uh, I've seen, I've, I've listened to a couple of your other books on Audible and you do a, you do a nice kind of explanation like you just did there. You know, you don't have a lot of frill in it, but you really get to the point and you cover a lot of stuff and it's really a, a, always a good read or a good listen. One thing I did, I do remember what I was going to ask earlier, what I was going to say, we were talking about astral projection and out of body experiences. Uh, I was just trying to make the saying that if if people if the if that theory might have credibility of people being able to experience actually they don't have to be dead people or people that have passed on they could also be experiencing somebody who is who is traveling outside their body and so uh, I just thought that was an interesting thing to consider as well that maybe at some point somebody was was doing some sort of investigation or they just had an experience of, of Preston like being <laughs> being there and they had no idea but they like oh my and then they wake up in the morning and they're telling everybody that they had uh, you know this this they think their house is haunted when it was actually just Preston who's sleeping four streets over and he's just traveling that night uh, I was just thinking about that <laughs> or Kim Kardashian and everyone is in her bedroom at night yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. he everyone out yeah astral traveling you know, and, and we we didn't really get to maybe we can talk with you again, Preston. But I'd love to talk more about um, Bigfoot and Yeti. I'm actually headed up to the the cryptozoology uh, museum up in Maine next oh. in two weekends. My brother's a big big fan of Bigfoot in particular, but I'd love to talk more about that and and obviously aliens and and the Greys and. One thing that I've been thinking about a lot lately is, uh, you know, there's there's been a lot of news over the past six months that's kind of hitting mainstream media, which is interesting in regards to, to aliens. Um, but one thing that came up was, I think it was like a pilot, maybe a couple of pilots that mentioned they had some sort of communication and, and they they were curious that... Is their patience going to run out with uh, run out with humans or not? Because we seem to meet them with so much aggression. It's like when they they're they're really not trying to to harm us, but we just keep meeting them with with very aggressive tactics. And so I, I, I've been wondering that myself. I'm like we seem to we seem to be approaching this in a really wrong way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a lot to unpack there, but yeah, I, I totally agree. I think that. To a degree, they have lost patience. They're not, certainly with our own governments. I think that's why there's so much contact going now because they're doing a grassroots movement announcing their presence because our governments are not being truthful or transparent. Mm -hmm. What about someone who wants to do out of body astral traveling or an out of body experience? Do you still do that training or is that kind of a ad hoc type of thing? Oh, yeah. Yeah. If you're interested, absolutely contact me. I'll send you some material and We'll talk you through it. And yeah, I'm still working with a few people here and there. Those who contact me, I do what I can to help them along. That's excellent. Well, great to have you again. And since Kyle has so many more questions and so do, so do I, we'll have to have you back again. We know you'll write another book soon, so we'll certainly have the opportunity. Uh, yeah, I've no, nothing really upcoming at this point, but I do have a website. Just punch my name in. It should take you there on the internet. But it's the actual address is PrestonDennett.Weebly.com. I have a YouTube channel where I put out my research for those who don't have the time or inclination to read. I'm all over social media. So if someone wants to contact me, it should be pretty easy. I always love hearing from people whether they've got a, you know, a question, a comment, or a story to share, or just want you know someone to talk to about this. Because that's why a lot of people contact me. They just need to bend someone's ear and get some answers. 
Thank you very much, Preston. Appreciate it. It's always a, a great hour of conversation with you when we have. Yeah, you. thank you so much, guys. I, uh, Preston, I just found you on Facebook and 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 YouTube, and I subscribed and and uh, and friend requested you. So uh, really cool meeting and talking with you tonight. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate that. Thanks very much. You've been listening to the Afraid of Nothing podcast. Please subscribe and like us on Facebook. Until next time, stay scared. Hey, you're still here? Great. Then why not listen to another episode? Visit afraidofnothingpodcast.com to peruse all the shows. That's afraidofnothingpodcast.com. And while you're there, Click the coffee cup icon to buy me a coffee and leave a review. I'll give you a shout out in an upcoming episode. And the world will know how swell you are.